Howdy, ho, ho, my good humans. This is Unnecessary Rambling. I'm Brandon Sylvia. Appreciate you for tuning in. Appreciate you for joining me. Appreciate you for joining me. Mr. Looney in the building again for an extended cut. Uh, we we discussed our top 10 games of the generation and talked about a lot of the good that has come this generation. And now I wanted to, we, we began the episode talking about if, you know, how we felt about the ninth generation of consoles, the Series X, PS5, and I feel like we there was a lot more meat left on that bone that we could really dive into and and break down. So figured why not have an extended cut version. So uh, how you doing today, man? How how you feeling about this this chat, this discussion, this topic? Yeah, but the five questions that you you had written down and obviously I've wrote down here, so I'll be looking down at the phone as to like pull off of what I was thinking. Um. There's a, there seems to be a lot more negative than I was thinking there would be, I'm being honest. Yeah. I've written down. But it's not like inherent negative. It's more missed potential more than anything. It's yeah. not just like this is bad. It's like, yeah, just missed potential. I feel you. I I guess we'll go ahead and start there just talking about is this generation really that bad? Because I, I see that common sentiment shared around a lot that like this generation has been a disappointment and uh, I don't, I, I, I'll kick it over to you and we'll unpack this kind of go back and forth. I think if you stack up the exclusive games to PS4, Xbox one, whenever they were at this point, you know, I guess that would be April 2017. If you look at those exclusive games versus the exclusive ninth generation games that we have of April 2024, and, and I have some wrote down here that we'll go over, I think it kind of, I don't think it paints this generation in as negative of a light as people would suspect, but the eighth generation really kicked into full force towards the back end of the generation in my opinion. So do we see the same thing happen here? It's it's, I, I don't feel like what we know that's on the horizon right now. I don't feel like extreme confidence in a lot of the games to really pull this generation to the next level. Like we, we had with the back end of the eighth generation. So yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it back to you there. Um, is there anything on the horizon that could be like a, a saving grace for this generation? Um, well, the initial thought is um, generations are becoming a lot more blurred. The industry is like heavily shifting <clears throat> because, as we saw, <clears throat> sorry, yeah. as we saw moving into like the PS4 and Xbox One, you saw like exclusives like uh, God, I'm drawing the blank, the Werewolf game that PlayStation had, the Order 1886. Oh, right, yeah. really, really good looking game that really pushed the graphical fidelity of it. And then Xbox side had Rise Son of Rome. Right. Both really masterclasses in like looking incredibly good, but were both criticized for fairly similar things of being really short experiences. Yeah. Pretty underbaked. We we saw this generation kick off in a obviously the pandemic didn't help. Of course. Because that's always going to be looming over it. Um but even like day one, there really wasn't much bite to be like, let's get a next gen console. The majority of the titles were already available on Xbox One and PlayStation 4. They were so hard to get a hold of as well. It just feels like they, they kind of put their foot off the pedal a little bit with how yeah. things were going and linking that back to how the generations are shifting, we're not seeing as big of leaps as we have done, you know, PS1 to PS2, PS2 to PS3. Like, it doesn't feel that way anymore. It feels more like a a refresher, more so than a leap. It feels like they're going down the route of phones and stuff yeah. like that. So... To to go back to the point you were just making, talking about the games, I, I tried, and guys, you can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong about this stuff, but I tried to compile a list of what I would consider like the 15 
best or 15 most prominent eighth gen exclusives for you know the the first four years or what you know of, of april 2017 the cutoff and then april 2024 the cutoff and so i'll go through that real quick and just just to uh, and I'll, I'll feed it right back to you to get an initial kind of reaction to what this sounds like. Right now, I would say these are like the top 15 for this generation that are exclusive to ninth gen systems. Baldur's Gate 3, Alan Wake 2, Final Fantasy 16, Spider-Man 2, Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth, uh, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, Jedi Survivor, Plague Tale Requiem, Returnal, Deathloop, Starfield, Mortal Kombat 1, Tekken 8, Flight Sim, Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. And I'll go through the April the April 2017 list of 15 real quick as well. Uncharted 4, The Witcher 3, Bloodborne, Gears 4, Fallout 4, uh, Arkham Knight, Horizon Zero Dawn, Titanfall 2, Resident Evil 7, Nier Automata, Doom, Dark Souls 3, Dishonored 2, Mafia 3, Dying Light 1. And I'll, I'll go ahead and kick it to you. But I think when you stack up 15 versus 15, you, you I, I would maybe give the edge to eighth generation, I would say, but I don't think it's by that much, you know? Mm -hmm. I think I would probably lean more aggressively with eighth. Really? Because of that line, that lineup is what feels missing from these generations, where you're, you're, li you're firing off games that are like huge, successful franchise sequels. Like you're talking Nathan Drake's saga being written up. The Witcher 3, like, holy shit. How big of an impact that game had on the industry. Yeah, Bloodborne. Like Bloodborne had an incredible impact on everything from Souls games to, like, showing what it means to be a Sony exclusive as well. Like, people are really, really clawing for that to be moved to, like, PC, and they've just still kept their grip on it and stuff like that. So it does feel like the generation we're in at the moment is is missing that. I don't know if you feel the same way. It feels we're getting newer IPs, but they're not landing anywhere close than these, you know, like the Witcher Freeze and stuff. It just feels missing almost. But it's... Me. Yeah, it's weird because like looking as I look back and forth and I like go game one by one and, and you know, check off which I would rather have, I, I would lean eighth generation, but I don't think it's by as significant of a margin. But like I said, that's the thing. And I guess tying back to the initial conversation we were having, I think that the eighth generation closed off so strong you know, Ghost and The Last of Us 2 and, and you know, on and on. The 8th generation just had a really strong, like, final two years of Fallen Order, Control, and just a real punch at the end of that generation. And I know that we, we still have at least three years left in this generation, so it's like, what the hell can we predict? But on the horizon right now is that, because we have GTA 6, that's like the game. You know, yeah. that's going to be the game that defines the generation. We know that. It was the game that defined the generation in uh, the PS3 and PS4 generation in some any, sense. Any generation, every generation the GTA games have landed on, which has been all of them, they've been, you know, yeah, massive yeah. impacts, like from GTA 3 all the way up to right. five. Industry-defining, yep. uh, generation-defining titles, and especially in our kind of core community because of course you have like uh, Rocket League and Overwatch and stuff that came out last generation that you could uh, Fortnite that was yeah that was last generation as well um mm -hmm. that you would you would put on that pedestal of like generation defining games but in our sort of I honestly more niche uh, community the the big game among the niche the actual community. gamers <laughs> <laughs> right yeah a slightly older crowd um yeah, Grand Theft Auto reigns supreme, and it it always has, probably always will, until something, some monolithic giant comes and topples it. But yeah, until Sleeping Dogs Two gets released, right? <laughs> <laughs> but but outside of Grand Theft Auto Six, like I, I'll my most anticipated game in development right now currently is probably Clockwork Revolution. 
from an exile to see what they could do with like a crazy budget you know the makers of wasteland what the hell could they do in a first person shooter bioshocky rpg create a character making decision like what the hell is that gonna look like that yeah, is probably they've, they've proven that they're able to um push the crpg genre so to do that next leap is definitely interesting um i haven't seen too much on it i don't think they've shown too much have they no really? just that one trailer it's fairly under wraps but this is what i was talking about with like why i'm a little bit disappointed i don't think i can name anything really myself that i'm like dude that is like i'm eyeing that like the i remember being on the 360 and playing the witcher 2 and then hearing that that was going to be on the xbox one that's what drove me to get that console i need to get this i need to have this console by the time this comes out and it just doesn't it it's it lacks that maybe maybe it's become jaded over the years from missed promises and you just think yeah i've got i've got like a thousand games in the backlog and stuff like that so maybe it's a different perspective but i yeah yeah i don't, I don't think i could actually name the game I, that's I driving th- me to be like yeah i can't wait for either the closing of the generation or bring on the next generation yeah I think you're spot on too with like the, you know, I think nostalgia hits a lot quicker than people expect. I think that in, in some part I'm even like mildly nostalgic for the eighth generation already. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm somewhat, I I don't think it takes as long as people would really expect for nostalgia to sort of set in and for the rose tinted glasses to kind of blind you a little bit. I'm not saying that's the case here. Um, no, because I, I, I 100% agree with you. It feels like it is setting in a lot closer because it's also the impact that it has on you as well. How powerful of an impact has this left upon you? Right. So that kickstarts obviously missing them things when you go down even just a few years and you're seeing things that aren't being delivered that were being delivered back then. It's like, how are you missing these things? Right, right. And... You know, I you you said earlier talking about seeing The Witcher Three get revealed and being like, "Yeah, I got to get an Xbox One for that," and that's uh, that. You know, we'll go ahead and tie straight into that. At, at this point in 2024, would you recommend someone who's like, "Okay, I, I have a PS4 Pro, uh, you know, Xbox One X, whatever the case may be," and they're like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of fine with it. I'm playing my." My uh, Spider-Man Miles Morales over here on this. <laughs> I'm playing my God of War Ragnarok, my Horizon. I'll wait a little bit and, uh, you know, pick up Spider-Man 2 and all that at a later time. Um, or, or, you know, w- whatever the, the the latest and greatest is. I'll wait a little bit for that. What would you say? Would you recommend someone in 2024 to pick up a PS5 or Series X for $500? So there's so many different variables um, to that like so many layers, it obviously depends on what you're playing. Because, for instance, um, the, what was it called? The the One X, the the big upgrade for the Xbox One. I wouldn't have probably picked that up if it wasn't for PUBG. Mm -hmm. We tried playing PUBG on the original Xbox, and it just, it was unplayable. It was a joke. Like, um, I don't understand how you can say that you have quality assurance teams and they released it in that state like it was tragic so for me it's how much of the tolerance do you have for like being a little bit further behind like do you have a tolerance for loading screens right like minute longs and stuff like that because i've after finishing um what was it Getting like three quarters of the way through the Liza P stuff, I ended up taking a break and going back to the 360. Jesus Christ, them load, them load times. It's just like, look, man, I love you, but this is like I can, I can read a book in the time it takes to you get to the next level on some of these games. So, I, I think they are worth it for that, for like you know, 
convenience and quality of life improvements, but they're not the the big leaps that you would probably expect. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's because yeah, I wanted to tie that into the to the thing you said before, you know, about the Witcher Three and how the getting that that Xbox One, that that was the impetus to move over. And I think back to like those E3s, E3 2016, 2017, 2018, all back to back, specifically with PlayStation, where in, or no, my bad, it was 2015, 2016, 2017. 2015 was the reveal of Horizon Zero Dawn. And I was just like, oh my God, dude, I got to play that. And then, you know, you, you had Uncharted 4 there as well. You had a bunch. And then into 2016, you had RE7. And then I think Detroit Become Human was revealed there. You like, you were constantly getting these games that were only going to be on this next generation box, the eighth generation, you know, the PlayStation 4 or you know, the Xbox One. And that was the thing where it was like, okay, I know the upcoming years there will be these games that are like absolute must plays. And I, that's the thing that I, I struggle with here for this question. Would I recommend someone buying a PS five or series X clockwork revolution for sure. Um, blade Wolverine, you know, the, some of the, the licensed games that we know about Jedi survivor through your, you know, the, the next Jedi game, there are some games that we know about, but I feel like we just know about less overall that that's coming soon. That's like must play. And, you know, also we know about the, the mid gen refresh, like the pro console that's coming soon. So it's like, if you haven't bought in at this point, I would probably well say, yeah, yeah. There's, there's no reason to, cause that's what, um, that's what a friend did on the Xbox one. They never, they never bought the one X because they had basically gritted their teeth so long. They were like, ah, well, you know, it's it's like two years out till the Series X, I may as well just wait. So, totally. Well, and there's no price drop, so it's like, if you're gonna have to pay, well, I guess there has been a price drop for the Xbox Series S. I don't it's think very, I've... it's very very minimal though. Yeah, I I have not seen a price drop for the Series X or the PS5. I uh, like I said. I could be 100%. This is all anecdotal, but if you're going to have to pay even, let's say $400 for the PS five and series X, if, if it's the equation is $400 for the PS five or series X, or I guess that's another thing is who knows how much these, these uh, pro variants are going to cost. Cause if it's going to yeah. be 600, then that's a different equation altogether. But if it's like five fifty or whatever, it's like, yeah, just, I'd, I'd say pony up the extra 150 and get the better version of the console because right now we're not even seeing all these promised features that were were uh, on the box. Like I got my damn uh, PS5 box right there, 8K, 4K, 120 HDR, <laughs> like it has all these these things on the box. Yeah, right all there. the and buzzwords, all the buzzwords. And right, and very, they're not being very, no, they're not being delivered on at all. Absolutely. For the most so, part. so it's like yeah, it'd be really really hard to recommend at this point going with this version when the the pro is is seemingly right around the corner for both console variants yeah well the thing as well is that the reason i mentioned the witcher 3 like you didn't play the witcher 2 on 360 yet you mm -hmm. said no like it was an incredible game but when you see and this is what i mean with there's nowhere near in the leap like you're talking the witcher 2 incredible game but the areas that you're going through are very very small corridor like sections and very compact and then when you see the witcher 3 and they're saying we're opening all this it's the potential as well and you saw this with that generation leap with like across the board like assassin's creed refought everything you know right. they went back to the drawing board they expanded everything it kind of blew up in their face with unity but it led to them going down the Origins and Odyssey route and stuff. And just across the board, it was just things got bigger and got more expansive. And they've kind of, it feels like they've gotten a, like, a little bit carried away with it. I don't know if you'd agree. Like, it feels like, okay, yeah, like, I think Odyssey was as big as I'd want yes. a map to be. For sure. I don't need it any bigger than that. For sure. And that might even be too big. 
well, yeah, it took me <laughs> the 120 hours, the 100 percent, like. And but that that felt like my limit because I went into Valhalla and it was just like Jesus Christ, like it just never ends. Like, okay, I guess you're quote unquote getting your money's worth, but it's you know I'm not enjoying myself and 60 percent minimum of this stuff, maybe even more. I'm gonna put a pin in that because that that exact thing I want to talk about the the bloat. I definitely want to jump back to that in a bit. Um, but my last point here for recommending these consoles, if I would or wouldn't recommend picking up a PS5 or Series X in 2024, the the thing that is like the Switch 2 is right around the corner. So if you're a one console guy or one console gal, I I mean, you're going to get more exclusive first party content on the Switch 2 than the PS5 and Series X combined. You know what I mean? So it's like, I would probably wait to see what the Switch 2 looks like. If you are a horsepower, you know, you want the technical, the the best in the market. Like, yeah, of course you're not going to get that. But I would say, you know, let, let, let's let let Nintendo announce what this thing's going to look like before you make a decision. Because if it is somewhere in the realm of it can play a lot of third-party games... It, it, it needs to be on par with the Steam Deck. Right. Like neck and neck. Like, if they heavily, like, go below that uh, yeah I, they like, should, I would have no interest in it they should probably go a little bit above it since it's coming out a couple years after the steam deck launched you know theoretically we know it probably won't but they, they get away with underdoing it a tiny bit but i'm talking like significantly like cutting corners to try and cheap out um when you got the best it, games on well, the well, their exclusives also don't really require all that much in the way of power, but if they were to go a little bit more stronger, you're talking, it's not about getting your first party games running better, which they already need to do. Don't get me wrong. Them, that new Pokemon game that came out, what was it the other year? Jesus Christ. Jesus, man. Like, no one's untouchable, but it would allow them to get these third party games onto their system, which they've lacked a lot of. Like you're talking like the Wii U, a ton of publishers skipped it. I don't I think EA like they either didn't release any or they heavily, heavily scaled back what they promised they were gonna bring to that system. Because it was just not powerful enough and it wasn't worth it for them. Do you think that is there a world where the Switch Two could be one of those situations where because in I got to lay this out in a weird way because it's not going to make sense unless I perfectly get what's going on <laughs> in my brain out my mouth. So console generation leaps we've been talking about, they have not been as impressive because they've been inherently more iterative. They're, you know, from, from when, when you're going into the HD era with the PS3 360, like that was mind blowing when you're going from 16 bit to 32 bit, you know, from the fourth generation to the fifth, that that's mind blowing, but it's more and more of these small iterative quality of life updates and just making games run better, but look similar to the last gen versions. Do you think that the switch to, because this market is one that I feel like there could be some, next level innovation taking place on a technical level, the handheld market where I don't feel like that's really going to happen with the console market. Do you think there's any chance that the switch Two has like some feature that, that makes people go, Holy shit. That isn't available on these other consoles. You mean? I, I, I don't know, you know, like I, would it be enough to just see some crazy feature that's handheld that, that you can access on a handheld device that you can also access on a console, but it's just like this mind blowing, mind melting thing that you're able to do it in, in handheld form or, or the, the portability, the, the flexibility, like, is there something there? Do you think the switch two could wow us on, on some level that we're not expecting? Um, if I'm being a hundred percent honest, I'm probably not the best person to ask. Obviously, the handheld stuff too. Being, I ditched that switch so quick. I did too. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking. I picked up Breath of the Wild for it, and I was like, "This is just 
a, a Ubisoft game. Like, I'm sorry, guys, but <laughs> it's just the Ubisoft game with a little bit more gimmicks. And then I tried playing, uh, I think it was Civilization VI, and it took like three and a half minutes per turn and to to go from my turn to do whatever the AI is doing back to me. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. But the thing that I, in the short period of time I had it, other than that, like the performance issues, they need to sort out the battery life. Like that is like the the holy grail that they need to try and find. Like if you can get 10 hours, 12 hours from high-end games of battery life worth, like that would be a huge, huge thing. Because you're talking the the people that pick these up, you know, a lot of them are using them on like plane journeys and stuff. If you have an eight-hour flight and you get like three hours in playing Cyberpunk and then it just dies, it's just like, well, you know, I'm just carrying around a block of plastic now. It's worthless. Yeah. So if they can crack that code more so than maybe technical leaps, I think that would do handhelds a lot more yeah justice in in convincing people to buy them as well yeah that that's a weird question to just spring on you so i, I apologize about the the lack of a uh, preparation i gave you there because <laughs> i it's just something that came to my mind and then uh, it's the thing is like i don't really i don't have a clear-cut answer in my brain either for what i could see this innovative next step being for the handheld market but i i, I think that's the thing that kind of excites me about the potential for the Switch 2 or Super Switch or whatever Nintendo's next console handheld is going to be, is that I feel like there is this air of unpredictability around it that I don't necessarily feel about the PlayStation ecosystem or the Xbox eco. Like, I think I know what the PS6 is going to be, and I think I know what the Series Y is going to be. You know what I mean? And it, I just feel like Nintendo would still... They, they still have some sort of je ne sais quoi where they could pull a rabbit out the hat last minute. It's because out of the three of them, they're also the one that doesn't shy away from gimmicks. And like yeah. that doesn't like for me, uh, like it's not something that I particularly care about and stuff, but you know, they were the people who paved the way with motion controls. And then the whole like tablet thing with the Wii U and stuff like that. Um connecting it i think you could connect that to your tv couldn't you the wii u kind of yeah. like you can with the switch so yeah. it was kind of like yeah here you go guys you know we give you the option of portability and then they kind of honed that with the switch um so yeah if anybody's got like a, a trick up their sleeve it's probably nintendo what what do you think in your opinion what was the last console generation that really gave you that that wow factor the the leap from x console to y console what was the last one that really gave you like that holy shit so it's funny because i wrote this obviously this was one of the questions it was um so i didn't get into i played a playstation 1 but that wasn't like a, a console that i grew up around with and it was heavily like ps2 and stuff but what i wrote down i don't know if like you'll understand it I hope it, it's, it's pretty simple but like i wasn't cognizant of games in the way that i am now you know as a kid you just you just consume it and i'm just enjoying the moment so i wasn't looking at it on deeper levels than that it was like blissful ignorance as it was so you're talking i played gta san andreas didn't play it properly. Like, I'm not like beating missions and stuff. I'm just walking around, blown away that I'm in a world, and mainly like Lego games and WWE games. And what I wrote down was, um, for me, it would probably be going from a PlayStation Two to a 360. And it wasn't a graphical leap that blew my mind. It was the fact that it was it was the exact same feeling I had booting up PlayStation 2 games until I I stepped into the multiplayer. Mm, where I yeah, picked up I picked up Vegas 2, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Vegas 2 in like a cheap bin and was like, oh you know, I like Tom Clancy games. I've played a few of them. Put it in, was playing through the campaign, was oh this is really fun. And then it was like here like there's a terrorist hunt available on like the the main screen. I was like, oh that's interesting. Like against AI and stuff. Kind of 
adds like a little bit more replayability and stuff. I was like, what was this like Xbox Live stuff? End up pick it like clicking on it and it threw you into a lobby. And obviously I've got no mic. I don't know what I'm doing. And there's three other people in this lobby like just shooting the shit with each other. Like much older guys and I'm sitting there thinking the hell have I like stumbled into? All right, obviously go back. I get the box back out and I see that there's a, a headset in there and I plug it in, piecing the things together. And I'm just blown away that I'm I'm sitting here at like eight o'clock at night talking to people in America. Yeah, playing the same game, and it's a one like one to one response time almost of you know what they're doing and what I'm doing in the game, and it's influencing. And it was just yeah, that, blew, that was it. That was when I knew when I wrote down this. I knew that it wasn't. It had gone from becoming like a hobby to a passion. Right. Yeah. What? Well, and we're a similar age range. I think you may be like three, four years younger than me. So still the youthful. <laughs> naive <laughs> and so i think we're going to share a similar perspective on this though like i mean of course objectively if we're talking the most mind-blowing which that's not the question that i'm posing here but if we were talking the most mind-blowing it, it probably would be you know, fourth generation to fit or it would probably be damn like atari 2600 to, to to nes you know what i mean just like whoa what what happened there like i i get that but i, I i'm with you where and mine actually, you know, you talk about the online functionality. Mine was looking at NBA 2K6 on the PS2 and then looking at NBA 2K6 on the 360. And I was like, yo, Shaq. I remember seeing like Shaq had the beads of sweat falling off his mm. head. It was crazy at the time. Yeah. And and they still they still do a lot of those tricks in the marketing today. I remember NBA 2K21 on the PS5. It was the same thing Zion Williamson <laughs> with the sweat bees all of a sudden. And it's not represented as much in game. But I do remember specifically like an NBA 2K6 on the, the next gen consoles. The characters in that game were so damn sweaty. It, it became like kind of <laughs> memeable where it's like that's that you're you're. You're going over the top there, but it was, it was so crazy to me to, to have that technology at the time. And, uh, I don't know, man, I, I do look at that jump to HD and, you know, you saw an 07, uh, I think 07 uncharted, the first uncharted came out. That was crazy. You know, the, these metal gear style games, tomb Raider style games, but to see what it would be on this next generation piece of hardware and then what that would evolve into on a technical level into the last of us, which was just, was it? Was it the first Uncharted game where it had the with the water? Like if he would stand in the water and a very small portion of his shirt would get wet, that would only be the thing that would get wet, and he would come out and it would show that. Or is that Uncharted? I know it's one of the Uncharted games. I'm not and sure. And that kind of that kind of blew me away. Like it's, it's small details like that that we just take for granted that yeah. we just expect. Yeah, that was like a massive, a massive thing. I remember seeing like, huh, it's interesting. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. No, it, that, that generation, the, the PlayStation one to PlayStation two was like specifically a nostalgic generation for me where it's, it, it was really, really impressive. I, I still would lean towards that, that jaw dropping moment from PS2 to PS3, you know, Xbox, OG Xbox to 360. But th there was something cool about jumping into the sixth generation just because the software was like, packed, dude, it, it felt like, it felt like weekly, you know, I was going to the blockbuster and grabbing some new PS2 game that was just uh, epic. You know, I mean, I mean, I feel like that generation, I played more games in that generation that were instant classics than any other generation ever. But that's more of a software mind blowing yeah. thing and not not as much of like a technique, which it was a huge technical leap as well. But yeah, I think we're we're in the same camp there of just being blown away by that, that P PS3 360 uh, seventh generation. Um, I'll go ahead and we'll rapid fire run through these last two here. And it's just going back to this, this current generation. I want to talk about things that modern trends that you think are hurting the generation or, you know, hurting the industry overall. And, and also we'll, we'll close off positive though. Talk about things that we actually do kind of like that are taking place in this generation. Cause there are some things and I think it's worth balancing it out. I don't want to do like, you know, I, everything on the internet is just 
hate, hate, hate Human negative. Gloom. Yeah, I don't. It's I don't easy, ever. It's easy to take that road. We which, don't like that. <laughs> yeah, and which here, my, my honestly, dude, I, I'm kind of that way naturally. So I think a part of me is I, I try to project what I want to be out here, so that that I don't know. I, I'm not a damn. Uh, I'm not a humanitarian of the year contender, but I I don't want to I don't want to put out as much negativity as I'm taking in. So I guess we'll 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 begin the conversation with the negative to to completely yeah. throw off everything I just said. <laughs> so this is for this generation that you mean, yeah? What's yeah. hurting this generation? Modern and... trends in this generation that you think are, are hurting the generation or hurting the industry overall, however you want to take it. I mean, there's so many obviously smaller things that I could pick apart with like Xbox kind of seeming to want to push out like phase out physical media and stuff like that but I don't think that's the thing that's hurting it the most and it, what's hurting it the most is two words and that's live service like, hands down like you're talking because just before I think it was like yesterday or the day before they finally gave their thoughts on how they felt uh, this is Warner Brothers, how they felt you know, the reception to Suicide Squad was and they were like, yeah, it's kind of ass, we're going to double down on live service and it's like, no, 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 stop, stop, for Christ's sake. Look back to what you delivered last year with Hogwarts Legacy and just shut the hell up and stop trying to chase this lightning in a bottle and just do that. The best selling game of 2022, the first game since I think 2008 that toppled Call of Duty. Yeah, exactly. Was Hogwarts Legacy? Hogwarts and Legacy, that's an entirely single player game. One hundred percent. In in a franchise that yeah, they came out with the Fantastic Beast films, and obviously they've announced that they've got that thing on the horizon. But it's a fairly dormant franchise as well. That just shows how powerful it is, and it's just like. Jesus Christ. And because what I wrote here is like, you know, Avengers was like the kind of big, the big thing where it was like, you guys need to just stop doing this. You're talking like the production budget that you require to make that piece of shit and how much you yeah. got back on it is, is nothing. Like it was a complete waste of time of both talent, resources, and money. But they were so close. They completely missed the mark. All they needed to do was just not make it live service. And just try and copy an ultimate alliance, and that would have sold a shitload of copies, and yeah. it would have got so much good buzz. Of if you were just playing an Avengers game, which is just a lot more graphically better than that Switch Ultimate Alliance, but just have it similar to an Ultimate Alliance game, and everybody would have been happy. This is something you're making me think about that I didn't even have wrote down. I hate the trend this generation where everything has to be live service, but you can't just have multiplayer. Like what happened to the days of just an attached multiplayer mode where, yeah, I can play ultimate Alliance by myself. I can play it with some buddies. That would be so sick with the Avengers. You and know, it's not, even, it's not even that long ago that these were proven concepts that were you fucking ghost of Tsushima launched as a solely single player game, added a multiplayer component and both of them were very successful. Right. Well on. received. It, 100% dude and on to that is I, I have a worry about Ghost of Tsushima 2 or what Ghost of whatever 2 is are they going to force reverse the roles make exactly. it heavily centered towards multiplayer and then put the you'd hope not like well, or are they going to go straight live service instead of the multiple? And I, I mean, I, they'll have a single player component, but will it be like more pushing towards, okay, let's, let's take this multiplayer out and go a little bit more servicey, a little more constant update. Like there, please no, <laughs> Jesus Christ. please no. That's something that really worries me as well. Cause you're talking about high quality studios. You're talking about rock steady. You're talking about, you know, uh, I don't, we don't know if this is going to happen, but in this uh, scenario, I'm talking about sucker punch. You're talking about crystal dynamics, who exactly this is oh my god it irritates me that the re <laughs> like avengers exists and that took away deus ex from me like you you, mm, you you went and funded that but you won't just give me like an ending to adam jensen's story like what just really they really 
sold well in games and stuff like that really oh it just irks me yeah i and and to that point tying straight to it publicly traded companies in general I, i'll say that is a yeah. modern trend but that's a trend that's been going on forever but that seemingly now more than ever they are a threat to this industry yeah. that we love man you're talking about wb with their wild proclamation of uh, we're gonna double down on suicide squad likes and not go to the thing that was the best selling game of 2022 or uh, of was that no that was 2023 2023 it was last year the best well, selling delusion. game the best selling game in a year that a lot of people consider the best year in video game history you just want to you know <laughs> homer simpson and bart you want to strangle yeah. are you are you crazy guys um yeah, yeah go ahead man I, i'm i'm stealing your damn shine here no, but that that just link that is it's the perfect link in. Like it's they just seem and it's because gaming is no longer niche. This is why these public trade the moment something takes off and they can smell the money, they circling around it like sharks. And it it feels like they're sharks with blinkers on because they're so focused on trying to chase that Fortnite money. You you can't see the the easy prey that's right next to you. The Hogwarts Legacy 2 or whatever you'd want to call it and all of these other things and you, you're talking like the Batman Arkham trilogy one of the most influential games ever like it, it, it the reason superheroes probably kicked off in the way that they did absolutely and this this is what you give Kevin Conroy his sending off as like that's fucking disrespectful man like, i'm sorry i'm sure he he put his heart and soul into it like he did with every single time he stepped up on the mic to take that role but that 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 is that's not what you'd want to be attached to is like the ending of your legacy that's that's a joke yeah it's such a bummer man it's such a bummer um it, in tying directly to that the you because you were talking about it earlier the bloat the bloat mm. dude that is it's seeming like we're we're coming to a sort of curve in the road seemingly where it it feels like we might get a little bit less of that just open world unnecessary bloat it seems like as these games are just ballooning in price and becoming more and more unsustainable that's the thing that dude I'll say right now, if you give me less content, <clears throat> but it's of a higher quality, I'm happy with that. Like if Spider-Man, because that's the example that makes the most sense because that was in the Insomniac leak where they were talking about, okay, can we cut Spider-Man 3 into two games and make it, you know, uh, 10 hours for one, 10 hours for another, whatever the case may be. I'm fine with that. If the 10 hours are like really, really high quality yeah, for both of them. If it's worth your time. This is what, like, how... It feels like gamers as well have blinkers on. Do you not realize that like 10, 15 years ago, you would be paying 60 bucks for a game that was 10 hours long? Exactly. Do you forget these things? And they were some of the most influential and most beloved games. We, we didn't complain about bloat. Exactly. It wasn't an issue. And going right back to the thing we just touched on, the Uncharted Gears, both of those series, neither, there's not a single game in until Uncharted 4 and I guess maybe Gears 5, there's not a single game in those franchises that are less than like, or that are more than like 10 hours for the, the main story. And then they have, you know, attached multiplayer modes where you can go and kind of have endless fun in these already pre-existing, pre-built worlds. Like, with mechanics that are already uh, the foundation has already been laid. So it's like, yeah, I, I I'm 100% in agreement, dude. I, I would welcome the, the return to 10 to 15 hour games. And that could be more of a consistent churn where you're getting games more frequently, because that's the other thing, dude, development cycles are ridiculous. You're talking about seven, you know, six to seven years for a big triple a game. Yeah. I'm, I'm laughing because Sorry to interrupt quickly. Um, obviously, just finished Jedi Survivor. Oh, did you finish and, it? Yeah, I finished it last night, and I was like, 
obviously the credits roll, and I'm like, oh, I'll wait for the post credit scene, dude. Fifty, and I'm because I'm scared because some games, if you skip the credits, you don't get the post credits scene and stuff mm. like that. So I was like, I'll just sit and wait, and you know, you know, it'd probably be like fifteen, twenty minutes, fifty odd minutes to get through the entire credits because you're listing literally everyone the guy who got the coffee that like, i get it everybody needs the shout out but jesus it just shows and i was thinking i was like this is why games are ballooning you're there's so many names on this list it's no wonder that these are 100 plus million dollar budgets and stuff like that and this totally. is obscene this totally. it, this isn't sustainable it isn't you can't keep doing this because the prices will also continue to rise the further you go down you're gonna yeah they need to rethink their strategy and shorten games oh man i've i i i we're already running long on this but i just had a really <laughs> random topic that i want to throw out at you real quick and we'll we'll bounce off this so when i think about like Grand Theft Auto 3, 2001, Vice City 02, San Andreas 04. You're talking about three at the time of the biggest games that had ever been created, three of the most influential games that had ever, that, that still, three of the most influential games of all time. And I, I just think about like, what if we had games that still looked like those games, like graphically looked like those games, obviously updated to some extent, but they they weren't these graphical powerhouses, but what if you had like a Grand Theft Auto game like that where you could make Mass Effect like decisions or have, you know, crazy, just destructible environments and you can do cool things on a technical level that are just so much more cost effective? You know what I mean? Like I because I, I see the return of retro like you know, on a smaller scale in the indie space with like El Paso Elsewhere and a lot of these games that sea of stars that are very much inspired by games from yesteryear but they do pretty damn well i don't know about el paso elsewhere but i know sea of stars did really damn well and it's like i wonder if there is some realm of triple a where you can get a team of 20 people together you know like ken levine's doing with his new studio yeah. ghost story games get a smaller team together to maybe create a slightly smaller experience which uh, uh, uh judas looks incredible but like Pentiment, for example, like I, I really want to see that market start to have a bit of a, a, a resurgence. Does any of that it's make sense? Pendulum to you? swing heavily that yeah. way is what it feels like because indie games already gained a lot of traction last generation. Like you're talking some of the biggest games that had the biggest buzz were indie games. Um, I just don't understand the the fixation on wanting to make everything look almost photorealistic because i look back at like you know like mass effect one was fairly washed out but like mass effect two and three were very stylized they weren't they weren't photorealistic but like i would i would be 100 percent happy if you can like it just stayed at that level that you know it it looked good like i was happy with that yeah but they just it just feels like the the whole chasing of buzzwords of, you know, photorealistic and it, you know, it looks much, much better in the side by side compare. And it's just like, it, that doesn't really do much for me. Like, well, and, and I hate to play Tarzan off of Nintendo so much because I'm not a Nintendo <laughs> guy, but it's like, obviously. It works. It works. This this pr this concept isn't unproven. It it's or it's being proved. Well, it it really makes me think because the thing that I think you and I both have uh, similar with our dis not dislike just our disinterest in Nintendo is we don't care about those IP. So, I would love to see these other, you know, Xbox, PlayStation, like. Pentiment, like these other games, Hi-Fi Rush. I would love to see more of that, of, of new IP. Like, I, I do think the idea of going back to like a Grand Theft Auto, that, that PS2 era of graphics, but with crazy physics and shit on offer, like you saw with Teardown, the game Teardown, had insane, yeah, yeah. you know, or even Minecraft, how, how 
insanely interactable those worlds are. But imagine that with a story, maybe some agency in the plot. Like we've never seen a Grand Theft Auto light game with any sort of real decision making going on. No, that would be incredible. I really would. I don't know. I, I, I and I guess, yeah, we could we could go on forever with this. Uh, <laughs> Do you have any other any other trends you want to uh, give the down vote to that you think are, are really harming the the industry? No, nah, um, nah, let's switch up and be a bit more positive. Let's right, the positives up. Um, uh, actually, I'm sorry. Last negative. I gotta I gotta <laughs> throw this out there. The fucking remake craze, dude. The remake remaster craze. Specifically with Sony, this is it's getting to the point. Okay, where yeah, yeah. Okay, because I was about to say the biggest, we've just obviously watched that showcase and like the thing I was most excited for this showcase was a, essentially a remaster, which was the, but the uh, cool what do you call it, Stalker, Stalker. Games. But the, the regurgitating of IPs that you've already touched up, I don't understand that. Well, the cool thing about Stalker is like, if I'm not mistaken, you can't access those games on a Series X right now, right? Like you can't, so... No. Essentially, like to me, to me, that's the thing. Until Dawn, backwards compatible. The Last of Us, backwards compatible. Tilo Two, backwards compatible. Uh, Uncharted Legacy of Thieves Collection, like you know, Gravity Rush Two, like these games are available already. But we can play them on the PS Five. <laughs> why, why, yeah. why, why not Infamous? You know, one and two. Why not uh, the classic God of War games? Like. You know what I mean? It's just it's hmm. really really bizarre, and that the the remake craze I I'm all for it for you know PS2 games and then even some PS3 games, uh, you know that era six generation. If they're and, stuck on if they're stuck on that genre like for, like Metal Gear Solid Four, we need that off that system. That and that that's that's just criminal. That that's locked the PS3. Totally. They need that everywhere, and it's not. To me, it's the waste of resources. That ballistic moon team, you know, that's made up of a lot of ex supermassive talent going back to work on Until Dawn, a remake of it. Like, <laughs> imagine because you you just sold it as a movie, so I understand you want to have this modern, pretty package of it available for people to play. But you can't make that game much prettier. You know what I mean? Oh, like, it's, it, it's it was literally almost it was uncanny valley esque, like how they look. Totally. To the point where it is un unsettling at times where it's like, okay, Jesus Christ. But I don't know. It think about like long term play. If you had that team who made another game like Unsold On, you know, you can sell that as a movie in a couple years. And then you have a whole I, new franchise. Like, I don't know. I never understood the why aren't you just doing a new entry in the series in that time? Well, if you're going to do the the film and stuff like that, surely that would be the best because then you'd be sucking in the already existing fans. And look, I know some people will be like, I want to play the first one first, but you have so many casual people that will just jump in and be like, oh, I love the film. Wow, that's coming out in like a few weeks or it's already out. I'll jump straight in. And then you double dip from both sides and you don't really piss anybody off. Now, I, w I really didn't even think about that until you brought it up. I will say. If this remake can get us an Until Dawn 2, then okay. If, if that's the case, if, if the movie does well, the remake does well, and then we get Until Dawn 2, all right. If you're testing the waters there, okay. Still think it's unnecessary. You can just, you can literally go and buy it. You can go buy a damn, uh, probably $10, a, a, a copy <laughs> of Until Dawn and play it on your PS5. But I, I, I never really thought about the continuation of the franchise. So I, I yeah, I would like to see that. But on to uh, close off the video with some positivity. What trends that you, you know, are, are appreciative of this generation that you would like to see continuing moving forward? Um, well, I'll quickly just brush on this because we've already talked about it. But like, obviously, I'd want to see more single player games. Push them a lot more forward. Sick. It felt like they were getting a little bit more traction, and then you have Warner Brothers come out like that. So it's just very strange. It's like I thought you kind of were shown that these are proven concepts and stuff, but clearly not. But um, something that I know you're not gonna care one bit about. But like, how to explain it? Like extended media, 
like you you watch like the Resident Evil animated movies and stuff. But like not only just that, like I'd love to see more tie-ins of books and graphic novels and stuff like this. And there's more than probably some people know already. Like Assassin's Creed is big on doing it before Square sold off all their Western stuff. Like they had big like a few Deus Ex books and graphic novels and two murder and stuff. But like I'd want to see more of that personally. Yeah, it's uh, going back to that first point you made about the single player dominance. That I that is really surprised me this generation with like, you know, we talked about Hogwarts, but even Baldur's Gate three last year, Tears of the Kingdom, um, you know, R Ragnarok sold incredibly well. Spider Man two sold incredibly well. Should I survive them? Yeah, right. We're like, we're having did wonders for Star Wars. <laughs> totally, we're having. We, we had it last generation, of course, where single player games really started to pick up steam in a big way. But now it's like they're kind of toppling charts and shit like they're they're really climbing to be, you know, 20. Granted, it's a lot of franchises. And that's the thing tying back to things I don't like. I, I I'm bummed out that a lot of new AAA IP seem to be struggling that that really is uh like uh, Banishers and Immortals of Avium, Callisto Protocol. I'm not saying all these yeah. games necessarily deserve. It's because the the trust has been abused. Yeah. You, if if you know that it's going to be a part of an already existing franchise, you at least have you've bought into that franchise. You've bought into the lore, the setting, the world, the characters, and you you can at least expect that. Okay, if the games like Mass Effect Andromeda, for instance, absolute ass game, like for the most part. But for people like me, I was able to just grip my teeth and be like, okay, there are redeemable things. It's interesting, I guess, from like seeing it from this perspective. But if that was like a brand new IP and didn't have the mass effect, that thing would have been dead on arrival. That wouldn't have even sold. That wouldn't have even broken like top 50 this yeah. opening week. Yeah, it, it's it does worry me though. Like a game like Banishers is really, really good. You know what I mean? And I, I wish, which you just made a really good point of you can't necessarily trust teams because Bioware, if you see that name, you think of the prestigious legacy of Dragon Age, and Jade Empire, and Mass Effect, and yada yada, KOTOR. Yeah. And then you get Andromeda, which I actually really, I didn't like at first, and I went back to it after it was cleaned up and really loved it. Uh, but really liked it a lot. And then you get Anthem, and it's like, okay, well, is that this is just a shell of its former self, the the development team. So you can't really trust the name of the developer. But I do wish there was something there because if you look at um, Don't Nod and you're talking about Vampire and you're talking about uh, Life is Strange, and I wish more people knew about these dev teams that way that they could have some trust in that opposed to just the the franchise, opposed to just the next God of War, opposed to just the next Zelda. Um, a thing I really do like about this generation, though, that I'm seeing more and more of is uh, experimentation with pricing structure, where we just saw uh, Helldivers. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, we just saw Helldivers two come out for I think thirty nine ninety nine, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, over here it's thirty four ninety nine. Yeah, right, really cheap, and that that really gets your foot in. It's what propelled both Remnant games to do as well as they did. Perfect because example. they were like, look, if we drop this a little bit, okay, yeah, we're technically losing money, but we're also just going to get people in the door because they're going to be like, oh, you know, it's not 60, 70 bucks. So, right. yeah, that's really, yeah. It, it's even Hellblade nice 2. Oh, what's you know? that launching it, at? I think the forty nine ninety nine, if I'm not mistaken. I, I don't even think it's, I don't even think it's 60. So, like. It's interesting. I mean, that's a triple A game by all intents and purposes, you know? And Alan was Wake. Was Plague Tale lower? Or were they. I don't know, because I played it on Game Pass day one. So I, I kind of. <laughs> we're, we're Game Pass shills. I swear. <laughs> we didn't pay for them. But yeah. So it no, feels like that would have been a game that would have gone a little bit under. Yeah. I could definitely see that, especially with the day one funding there. Um, but yeah, man, I just I really appreciate that because you saw Skull and Bone Suicide Squad both come out and, and flop hard at 70. 
you do kind of wonder which they have to recoup that money, like the, the amount of, of money that went into making those games dwarfs hell divers too, which is crazy, but it, it, I, I do like that experimentation and the rise of, of, of interesting double A's and Indies in general, you know what I mean? With like clear focus, clear vision, smaller teams, like we talked about earlier, um, and then experimenting with that price on top of it. Yeah. It, that, that is probably my favorite trend that I, I see. I think that actually has promised by the end of the generation. I think we're going to have prices all over the, which we already do, but I think you'll even see uh, Assassin's Creed Mirage is actually the perfect example. I think that was thirty nine ninety nine when it launched. The, I think we're going to, or maybe forty nine ninety nine. We're, I think we're going to be seeing a lot. Yeah. I think we're going to be seeing a lot of fluctuation with that. A lot of, because the seventy dollar game is going to stay. It'll probably increase, but I, I just hope that more publishers experiment uh, across the full the full spectrum with their prices. That was a good point. I like that. You have anything else you want to shout out here, or you want to close this? No, I think that's down? that's all me for this. Perfect. I last thing, I'll hit you with this on the fly. What would you rate this generation if you had to give like a one to ten score? I'll give you my score first, so you can think about yours. If I had to rate this generation so far, obviously talking PS5, Series X, um, and you own both consoles as well, PS5 and a Series X. The PS5 is like at my feet. Oh, is underneath it underneath the desk? It's not been turned <laughs> on in in like eight months. But yeah, yeah, I own both. Um, right now, me. I would say I'm around a six out of ten. Wow, so low. I, Are you I'm, talking? Hold on, is that like taking into consideration, like critically, as to the reception, or is this entirely based off of like your own enjoyment of the generation? Is that it's sitting at six? Yeah, my own enjoyment of the generation. I would say is wow. around six. I, I, just for I don't think that the software. It, it we've had some really 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 good games but the fact that i can play so many of them on a ps4 if i had it i think that's a big thing that that brings it down which i guess that would kind of lean more towards a critical analytical point than an enjoyment point of view i i guess it's hard okay. to really separate the two i would say i would say for me just overall i would say i'm at a at a six out of ten i only have like maybe a few games that I look at as like generation defining titles so far. No, that's fair enough. Um, God, I, I think I'd be in like the mid sevens because this is like the generation for me has been, they've spat out so many good like strategy turn based games and stuff like that. Like I've been showered with them. Like you're talking in in this year alone. I've been given like five, six games of that ilk, and they're all high eights for me personally. That we're talking about. So like, it's all it all depends on what you're being given as well, I guess. So yeah, I'd be like mid sevens, high sevens. Yeah, because I. When I look at the PS4 generation, I think I would put that at like a 9 out of 10. I think I would put the PS3 generation at like a 7-ish, 8-ish out of 10. I think I would do PS2 at like a 9.5 or so out of 10. So like in comparison to those, I think that's where I would say you, that... You also have the benefit of... you stayed libraries. in that PlayStation. Well, you stayed in that PlayStation ecosystem as well. I had to sit there and grip my teeth through Xbox One's generation of just utter shit. <laughs> like, True. You're, you're talking... That's a really good first, point. first, like, four years, I, I got nothing. Like, really? In comparison to what PlayStation was getting when I'm... So for me, like, I'm a lot more warmer on this generation because I'm, I'm thinking, like, holy shit, I'm getting JRPGs that I didn't think would ever land on these generations. They're continuing to land Yakuza on this. We're getting massively high budgeted turn based strategy games from PC. Like the a lot of these PC games come at sh stalker today. Right. Wouldn't have ever expected to get that on a on a modern Xbox console. It's hard enough to run on a on a PC in this day and age. So for them to land that on an Xbox, that's incredible. So that's... I, I yeah, maybe I'm a little bit warmer because I've had 
<laughs> much less to eat. <laughs> That's a damn good point. As a primary Xbox One player going into the Series X generation, there is no doubt. That, I mean, yeah, no doubt I would feel the same way. And I guess on the opposite, I'm not really satisfied at all with PlayStation's first party output. Exclusives, they're loaded to the fucking brim with exclusives. But I am a little bit bummed about the, like we talked about earlier, the live service push over there and uh, the the remaster, remake focus over there. So I guess, yeah, that makes sense why I might be a little bit lower, you might be a little bit higher. Because I'm a little bit more down on PlayStation, you're a little bit more up on Xbox, which I'm way more up on Xbox as well. Yin and yang is what we are. <laughs> all right man well i appreciate you joining me dude and i appreciate all you good people for tuning in hit us in the comments let us know your thoughts on the generation overall i just wanted to expand on this talk more about it dive a little bit more into detail giving our full thoughts full breakdown on the uh current generation of consoles so yeah i hope you all enjoyed this and uh check out looney's channel i'll be over there we're gonna record a uh deep dive discussion on the xbox publisher what the hell did they call it publisher Show, public uh partner showcase partner showcase that's right we'll, we'll be doing a full conversation about that talking some achievement hunting i'll have his uh channel linked in the description and all that good stuff so go over there check it out looney appreciate you for joining me man thanks for having me man